Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part two of the transportation segment. In part two we will discuss planes and whether planes can be made more efficient. We will discuss ships and public transportation and bicycles. Let's talk about planes. We will examine how much energy it costs to travel on a plane. Uh, we will look into where the energy is going during the flight of a plane and we will determine what is the best speed of a plane to cover a certain distance at the lowest energy expense. Let's try to answer the question how much energy it costs per passenger and distance to travel on a plane. The example is a Boeing 747-400 with 416 passengers and with 240,000 liters of fuel it can go 14,200 kilometers. So we can use these numbers and calculate the energy per distance and passenger. So we plug that in and we end up with 39 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers and passenger. So that's about a third of what it costs to drive a car. So if you have three uh, people in a car, then you compete with the plane in terms of energy efficiency. But of course, you're much slower. Let's see what this means in terms of daily energy consumption. Of course, it's difficult to calculate uh, a daily number here because one doesn't go on a plane trip every day. But let's assume you go on one big trip to Europe or something of that sort. So here we assume uh, 12,000 kilometers that may be going from New York to London and back. And we assume an 80% full plane, which may be a reasonable average number. So we calculate the energy for this trip and we divide it by 365 days one year and so we end up at 16 kilowatt hours per day. You can compare this now with the numbers that we calculated for cars and houses. The number for cars was 58.7 so it's uh, maybe a factor 3.5 and uh, 30 kilowatt hours per day for an average house so that's a factor too. So if you go on one trip per year, one big trip, then you would basically increase your energy bill by half of what it is for your house during that year. So it's quite substantial uh, how much energy goes into a, a plane trip. An interesting question is where does all this energy go? Essentially the way it works, airplane engines provide thrust. That's the force that pushes the plane forward. And this force is being used to overcome parasitic drag. That's just like in a car, the energy that is put into swirling the air around the plane. And it is put into induced drag. So the induced drag is something that we do on purpose. That's by uh, setting the wings at a certain angle and that diverts air that flows against the wing downwards and because of this downward uh, push of air the plane actually stays up in the air. So this induced drag is the second part uh, into which the uh, uh, thrust goes. So we can say that the total engine thrust required is equal to the parasitic drag and the induced drag together. So it's an interesting question now to investigate how do parasitic and induced drag depend on the velocity of the of the plane? And what we will find is that there is a, a optimal velocity at which the energy required or the thrust required per distance is the uh, lowest. Let's look first into the parasitic drag force. We are interested in how it depends on the plane velocity. This is exactly the same like for cars, so we can use the same formula that we know already. So the parasitic drag force is just one half times the density of air times the drag coefficient times the cross section of the plane times the velocity squared. So it's clear that the parasitic drag is proportional to the velocity squared of the plane. Now let's look into the induced drag. This drag is introduced on purpose with the goal to provide enough lift to the plane that it can stay in the air. 
the condition that needs to be met is that the lift force is equal to the gravitational uh, attraction that acts on the plane. How can we generate lift? Well, as the plane travels through the air, we can give it a effective cross section. This is the yellow box around the plane, so it's about the wingspan uh, squared, so that's the effective cross section AS. That's different to the cross section that we used for the parasitic drag, which is just the outline of the of the actual plane. This picture here actually shows dramatically why we're putting this box around the plane as its effective cross section for the lift. You see here they, they put some smoke in the air as a plane f flies through the air and you, and you see these big vortices around the wings. So this is essentially uh, what the plane does to the air and in this process the air is being pushed downwards. So what we need to do is now, or what the plane needs to do, is to accelerate enough air mass downwards that the reaction force is equal to the gravitational force that acts on the plane. That comes from Newton's third law. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So the, the plane throws air downwards and in exchange it gets lift upwards. Let's try to put a formula to this. So the mass of the air that is in the cylinder that is affected by the plane as it, as it flies through the air that is just the density of the air in here times the length, which is the, the distance uh, that is covered over a certain time of flying, times the cross-sectional area, which is just this AS here, this uh, wingspan uh, squared area. So that's the mass of the air that is being pushed down. Density times velocity of the planes times time, so that's the distance times the cross-section. So we start out by equating the lift force and the gravitational force, which is the condition for the plane to stay in the air. So we plug in for the lift force the mass of the air times the acceleration at which the air is being accelerated downwards by the plane. And that's just the velocity of the air that it has after it's being pushed times the time that we are flying through this cylinder. And that is equal to the mass of the plane times the gravitational acceleration. So we can divide now the time out and we get this and then we can solve it for the velocity of the air that we need. And that is just equal to the mass of the plane uh, and the gravitational acceleration divided by the density of the air times the cross-sectional area and the velocity of the of the plane. So we see that the velocity of the air that we need in order to generate enough lift is inversely proportional to the velocity of the plane. And of course we also see here the heavier the plane the more velocity we need because we need to push the air harder in order to get enough lift. The only design parameter this equation depends on is the cross-sectional area of that cylinder that is being affected by the plane AS. So this is essentially a design parameter of the, of the plane. And we again have an inversely proportional relationship. So if we make the uh, cross-section larger, the velocity of the air can be slower. Or in other words, we can also think of it that if we have a low velocity of the plane, we can compensate with a larger cross-section in order to get enough uh, velocity of the air being pushed down. And this is used when airplanes extend their landing flaps so they can slow down further before they touch the ground. Now we can calculate how the induced drag depends on the plane velocity. Force is just energy divided by distance over which we apply the force. And so in the case of the induced drag, we can simply divide the kinetic energy of the push down air by the uh, travels distance. And so we get one half m air times velocity of the air squared divided by the velocity of the plane times t. And now we can just take the uh, formulas from the previous slide and plug them in for the mass of the air and the velocity of the air. So we do that here and we end up with this one half 
times the mass of the plane times the gravitational acceleration squared divided by the density of the air times the velocity squared of the plane times the effective cross section. And so what we see here is that the induced drag force is proportional to the reciprocal square of the plane velocity. So the induced drag force depends on 1 over v squared while the parasitic drag force depends on v squared. This is shown here. Here we see the uh, thrust versus the speed of the plane. The blue curve is the induced drag and the green curve is the parasitic drag. So blue is proportional to 1 over v squared and green is proportional to v squared. So if you plot the total thrust, that's the red curve, it has a minimum and this minimum appears to be just at the point where the parasitic drag and the induced drag are the same. Therefore we can calculate the velocity at which we need the least thrust and of course that means at that point we also need the least energy because energy is applied force times distance. And so most planes are operated at this velocity to conserve fuel because fuel is expensive. And so all we need to do now is to equate the parasitic drag and the induced drag uh, forces and we plug in those formulas that we found previously and then we can solve this for the optimum velocity and we get this here. So we see that depending on the design of the plane the speed can be quite different at which we fly at the lowest energy consumption. Planes usually travel at this optimal speed because flying itself is a very energy intense process and so for commercial flight it is of course a big cost factor how much fuel is going through the turbines and so if you find yourself on a commercial flight and they show the uh, cruising speed on a monitor you will usually find that the speed is pretty close to this 540 miles per hour number. Let's now determine the thrust at optimal speed. Since the parasitic drag and the induced drag are the same at the optimal speed we can say that the thrust is just two times the parasitic drag. So we can just get rid of the one-half factor in the formula for the parasitic drag. And so if we substitute the optimal speed of the plane with the formula that we derived previously, we end up with this expression down here. And so we see that this thrust at the optimal speed is just a dimensionless constant that depends on the shape of the plane. So here we have only the drag coefficient the effective drag area and the effective cross section under the square root and that is multiplied with the weight of the plane. That makes it fairly easy to calculate the uh, necessary thrust for a given plane and with that of course the energy that it takes to move that plane over a distance d and this is what we will do on the next slide. Please note that in this calculation we will use the drag to lift ratio which simplifies this dimensionless constant into a simple uh, multiplication of the drag coefficient with the ratio between the effective drag area and the effective cross section which is replaced with the constant FD. Okay, let's estimate the energy cost per weight and distance for a modern plane. So energy per distance and mass, that is just the thrust force divided by the mass of the plane. And we need to multiply that with the efficiency of the engines. That gives us the total energy input that we need. For this, we can just use the formula now from the uh, previous slide where we use the drag coefficient times the lift to drag ratio of the plane and multiply it by the weight of the plane. So if we divide that by the mass, then the mass is here just divide out and we end up here with the efficiency times the square root over the drag coefficient times the lift to drag ratio and the uh, gravitational acceleration. So this here for a modern plane where uh, CD times FA is about 20, that with a efficiency of about one third turns into 0.15 times the gravitational acceleration. 
and that is about 10 meters per second squared so we end up here with 1.5 meters divided by second square. Now the meters per second squared they can be converted to kilowatt hours per ton kilometers as is shown down here and so what we have to do is um, to go from one set of units to the other uh, we simply need to enter the um, conversions shown as shown here so we have kilowatt hours is just a uh, thousand joules per second times uh, 3600 seconds in one hour and we divide that by a thousand kilograms uh, times a thousand meters so these are just the conversions of ton and kilometers and this gives us in the end here 3.6 meters per second squared per kilowatt hour uh, ton kilometer and so with this we can convert the 1.5 meters per second squared into 0.41 kilowatt hours per uh, ton kilometer okay so this is for the entire plane typical weight distribution of a, a modern big plane is about 80% plane and fuel at takeoff and 20% payload so we have to multiply this here with about a factor 5 uh, to arrive at the energy cost uh, for the payload and that gives us then uh, 2 kilowatt hours per ton kilometers the big question is of course now how can airplanes uh, be significantly improved in their energy efficiency we saw on the previous slides that essentially the energy efficiency of an airplane is defined by the uh, lift to drag ratio the cd times fa uh, square root uh, number the current opinion is that most of the improvements here may come from improving the drag coefficient itself so there are two ways to uh, work on this one is laminar flow control around the hull so making the air uh, pass by the airplane with fewer um, disturbances and uh, vortices so by making this hull really smooth uh, it is estimated that about 15 percent may be uh, achieved in reduction. Another way to uh, go about it is an entirely different design style of the of the plane. So the blended wing design, as you see it here on this figure, there maybe another 18% of reduction of that drag coefficient might be possible. So if we combine these two uh, reductions, then we may get an, an overall 16% increase in efficiency. That comes from the fact that the numbers here are under the square root. So only 16% uh, is left here after we do the square root. Another screw to turn for better efficiency is the payload to gross weight ratio of the plane. And of course, that can be improved by making the plane lighter. You may have heard that the uh, Boeing Dreamliner is considerably more fuel efficient than the 767 predecessor. This comes from the fact that the Dreamliner uh, has been designed with a lot of component materials such as uh, carbon fiber, which is much lighter than the aluminum that was uh, used for the 767 predecessor. So in summary, we can say that the biggest difference between airplanes and other transportation methods is that airplanes cannot be made more energy efficient just by operating them at a slower speed. Depending on the particular design of an airplane, it has an optimum speed at which it uses the least energy per distance. About half of the energy that the plane uses at that optimal speed is used to keep the plane in the air. This and the usually high speed at which the airplane travels causes the very high energy use of airplanes. This and the usually very high speed at which planes travel causes a high energy consumption. One can say that a full airplane of current design uses about the same energy per distance and person like a car with two occupants. When it comes to payload energy cost, one can say that airplanes use about one magnitude more energy than trucks and about two magnitudes more than trains. And we will see on the next slides that in comparison to container ships, uh, it is about three magnitudes. When it comes to making airplanes more energy efficient, most of the gains that can be expected will probably come from weight reduction, which will directly increase the payload to weight ratio of airplanes.
Now let's have a look at ships. Let's discuss first uh, ships for personal travel. Ships have a great advantage. They float by using buoyancy, so they only need to overcome the drag force in the water. That makes them generally a very efficient means of transportation when it comes to payload. However, since ships travel fairly slow, when it comes to personal travel, ships need to provide a lot of space to make people comfortable. And that leads to a very poor payload to gross weight of the ship ratio. And that in turn uh, causes a very high energy consumption per distance and person. So here we see the Queen Elizabeth II, which is a luxury cruise ship. And we examine here a trip from London to New York, which is about 5,800 kilometers. And on this trip, the ship will use about 3,000 kilowatt hours per day and person. So it takes four days of cruising time. It goes 63 kilometers per hour. It costs about 12,000 kilowatt hours per person, this trip. The airplane does uh, 63 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers in person. So the same trip would cost about 3,654 kilowatt hours per person. So we see already there is a quite substantial difference. It's about a factor four between the plane and the Queen Elizabeth II. The main reason for this is that the Queen Elizabeth has to move about 40 tons per passenger. Now the Queen Elizabeth II is of course a luxury cruiser which is mainly used for leisure travel. Before the advent of affordable plane travel, however, there was economy ship travel between Europe and the US. It is not available right now for obvious reasons because planes are so much more uh, energy efficient and fast. But here as an example, uh, let's discuss the TSS Rintam, which uh, went from London to New York from 1952 to 68. And about 68, that is of course the moment when uh, plane travel became more affordable because of bigger planes and economies of scale. So this ship traveled at half the speed of the Queen Elizabeth, 30.5 kilometers per hour. And it took about, therefore, eight days to travel from London to New York. The ship had a maximum occupancy of 893 persons and it weighed 15,051 tons. So that puts it at 16.9 tons per passenger, so less than half than the Queen Elizabeth II. And that, of course, leads to a considerably reduced energy use per person and distance. So it puts it at 121 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers in person. However, if you remember the energy use of large planes, this is still about twice the energy per person used on a Boeing 747 for the same uh, distance. Alternatively, you could also think if one could drive a car from London to New York, if you would drive this car alone, then you would be able to cover this distance at about the same energy expense as this ship was able to. Ships are much better when it comes to freight. Container ships maximize payload. Here, the example on this slide is one of the biggest ships that is in service right now, the Emma Maersk. It is about 400 meters long and 56 meters wide. It can take 14,000 uh, 20 foot containers and the maximum weight in each of these containers is 24 tons. So this ship is propelled by one 82 megawatt turbocharged inline eight two-stroke diesel engine. We see here actually a picture of the crankshaft and this here is a person so you get an idea how big this engine is. It has 14,560 liters of displacement. So the fuel consumption of this beast at 57 kilometers per hour is 0.0046 nautical miles per gallon. So that can be translated into about 4,500 liters per 100 kilometers. So if we use the 9.5 kilowatt hours per liter of fuel number that we encountered earlier, then uh, this means that this, this ship uses uh, 43,000 kilowatt hours of energy per 100 kilometers. While this seems a large number, this is only about twice what, or not, not even twice, what a Boeing 747 uses for the same distance.
that this is about 26,000 kilowatt hours. So if we assume that these containers are loaded with half the maximum weight on average, so that translates into 168,000 tons of payload on this ship, it would cost only about 0.0025 kilowatt hours per ton and kilometer. So if you compare that with uh, previously calculated numbers, we can say that this is about one tenth of trains, one hundredth of trucks, and about one thousandth of the energy use of planes. So this makes ships very energy efficient when it comes to freight. One could say that when it comes to the transport of goods, the transport across the oceans with this type of ship is the smallest part of the energy expense of moving these goods. Most of the energy expense will be incurred on land when the containers are moved to their final destinations on trucks or trains. One big issue of uh, freight ships right now is that they use a very cheap type of oil for their diesel engines, which is called bunker oil. And this uh, type of fuel contains 4 to 5 percent of sulfur, and that creates, of course, uh, sulfur dioxide when this fuel is burned, which then turns into sulfuric acid when it comes in contact with water. To put this in perspective, gasoline used for cars only contains about 0.02 percent of sulfur. Now let's discuss public transportation a bit. It's obvious that if many people share a vehicle, the uh, payload to vehicle weight ratio improves and with that uh, one can achieve a better energy result per person and distance traveled. Another advantage is that many people share the same cross section of the vehicle. That is very clear when you look at a high speed train like this. All these people that sit in these cars, they essentially share the cross section of the locomotive part of this train. Issues with public transportation are that often the vehicles aren't fully occupied and at that point then one moves around a big and heavy vehicle for only a few people that sit inside. That is a big issue because public transportation also needs to be offered during off-peak hours so that everybody uh, still can get home. Another issue in particular with trains is that they need their own infrastructure and of course there is an energy cost associated with building this additional infrastructure. Rails need to be built and also they need to be maintained. This figure is from an interesting study by Chester and Horvath that was published in 2009. They made a life cycle assessment of various transportation methods and so you see here a comparison between personal vehicles such as sedans, SUVs and pickup trucks then uh, urban diesel buses during off-peak and peak hours and various light rails. And then also there's a comparison with uh, aircraft of uh, various sizes. And in this study, they took not only into account the energy used during the active vehicle operation, which are the gray uh, bars, but also all the energy that it costs to provide the uh, infrastructure and manufacture the vehicle and produce the fuel and transport the fuel and maintain the infrastructure and so forth. So these colored parts of the bars, they essentially represent these additional energy expenses for each of these transport methods. And so what we see here is that a diesel bus during off-peak hours can be less energy efficient than a, a pickup truck. We see that here. So the final energy number is higher than the uh, pickup truck. So it would be much better to use a regular sedan than using a bus during the late evening hours in a city. Now during peak hours, the very same bus is much, much better than all the uh, personal uh, vehicles. When we look at the light commuter rail uh, systems, the the actual energy consumption of the vehicles is very low, but there is a very high cost associated that is actually higher than the, um, than the energy used uh, by the vehicle for maintaining and providing the uh, system. And so if we add up everything together, these rail methods are still better than personal vehicles, but not very dramatically so.
If you look at the aircraft, it's obvious that the additional energy costs for the infrastructure are actually only a small part of the total energy expense. And so this is where aircraft have an advantage over the other methods because aircraft have a very limited infrastructure. All you need is airports, but nothing in between. The very high energy consumption of the vehicle is partially compensated by the comparably low energy expense for the infrastructure. The energy consideration is not everything when it comes to public transportation. A great benefit is of course that one doesn't need to own or maintain a car, but another one is convenience. This is obvious when considering high-speed trains. The latest generations of these trains, they can go up to 380 kilometers per hour. That is only about 2.5 times slower than uh, the average passenger airplane. This makes these trains very competitive with regard to speed uh, when compared to short distance plane travel. Like, let's say if you would go from Boston to New York, because trains usually, they have their train terminals within the city center and there is very little time and effort to get on and off the train if you compare this with the average airplane trip where you have to be at the airport a couple hours before and then go through security and so forth. That is a clear advantage that uh, trains can have over airplanes. A very interesting alternative to conventional transportation methods are electrical bicycles which in recent years have become very popular in Europe and in China. Bicycles in general are ideal for short distances and if one looks at statistical data most of the trips that are done with cars uh, are actually short distance in the range within a few miles. In cities bicycles are usually faster than cars and typically much faster than uh, buses. The reason for that is obvious. Uh, it doesn't take time for parking. One simply puts it in front of the door wherever one goes. There is no walking to a car or a bus stop. One can typically use shortcuts that cars cannot access or that are inconvenient for cars. Uh, traffic jams are easily bypassed. With electrically assisted bikes, the convenience aspect is dramatically increased. One can achieve much faster speeds at much lower physical exhaustion. If one considers the energy cost of electrically assisted bikes, the energy costs are almost negligible in comparison to cars. They're easily two magnitudes lower. Furthermore, the ownership cost of electrical bikes is considerably lower than that for cars. So all this added together makes such bicycles a very viable alternative to cars in urban traffic. There are two basic types of electrically assisted bicycles. The most advanced technology is the so-called pedelec, uh, so that stands for pedal electric cycle. And in the pedelec, the control of the electrical motor is done by pedaling. So the electric motor only kicks in once the rider applies force to the pedals. Usually an electronic control on the handlebar can adjust the degree of electric assist that is desired. This is done via a torque sensor that is somewhere in the chain drive of the bicycle. And this uh, torque sensor measures how hard the bicyclist turns the pedal and then the electric motor is turned on accordingly. This has the great advantage that there are no additional controls on the handlebar of the bicycle and that it can essentially be ridden like a standard classic bike without electrical motor. This is illustrated on this graph. So this here is the pedaling force and this here is the velocity of the bike. As you accelerate from a full stop, in the beginning you get a lot of electrical assist and then as you ease off with on the pedal also the electrical motor uh, reduces its torque. Then we may go up a hill and at the hill the torque on the uh, cranks is increased because you pedal harder. So you put more uh, torque in, but you will also get more uh, electrical assist at that point. Once you reach the top of the hill, you can accelerate to full speed as shown here. And so you increase your torque and the electrical motor keeps helping you. So you reach a higher end speed than you would with a regular bike. And then at a certain speed, these bikes typically cut off the electrical assist for safety reasons. The second type of electrical bicycles, the so-called e-bikes, 
they do not have this torque sensor. They operate like a moped, so you have a sort of a throttle control on the handlebar with which you can simply control the electrical motor to go faster or slow down. So these bikes, they can be ridden more or less like a small motorcycle. They usually also allow to pedal along, so if exercise is desired, one can get that also with these e-bikes. Because of this smaller emphasis on actually pedaling, E-bikes typically have a bigger motor and they also need bigger batteries and with that of course they also have a higher energy consumption than pedelec bicycles. As said earlier, uh, bicycles have one disadvantage in the current infrastructure because they are much weaker than cars and less protected. It is more dangerous to ride a bicycle, especially when cars are around. That means that bicycles need a dedicated space in the infrastructure that is reserved to them. You see here a couple pictures from European scenarios where bikes are being given their own small lanes uh, along with the cars. Here you see a roundabout, so there's a bike lane going around in addition to the uh, car lane. Here just a, a regular city street uh, that has a, a bike lane that goes in parallel to the main uh, vehicle lanes. It may be counterintuitive, but the best results are actually achieved with this kind of arrangement where there is only a marking but not a physical barrier between bikes and cars. Because this helps make bicycles more part of the actual traffic and they are more visible to cars and more present in the uh, traffic pattern. Another important point for bicycles is that the uh, streets are illuminated at night. Another interesting concept for city centers are bicycle rentals. There are currently several approaches being tried out around the world and they range from just putting out free bikes throughout the city to sophisticated pay-per-use uh, systems with GPS location tracking and so forth. One of those systems you see here, these pictures were taken in Seville in Spain. So there is a, a machine where you can pay for the bike and then there are these stations where the bikes are locked and the location of the bikes is tracked, so one can look it up on the internet where to find one of those bikes. It's time to summarize. Here's a graph that compares the various personal transportation methods in terms of energy consumption uh, per 100 person kilometers, and on this axis we have the speed that is being achieved by these various transportation methods. And so we see here the typical suspects for high energy uh, intensity, ocean liner, car and airplanes. Airplanes of course have the great advantage that they're fast. High speed trains, they combine considerable speed with a low energy expenditure. When it comes to personal local transportation uh, at slower speeds, then uh, public transportation and the bicycle are noteworthy for low energy consumption. So in the end, if you look at all these various transportation methods, one really needs to consider what one needs and then try to use the one that has the lowest energy consumption to be as sustainable as possible. When it comes to freight transportation, a similar picture arises if you compare planes, trucks, rail and ship. Planes are the most energy intense. Here is the energy intensity in megajoule per ton and kilometer. And there's also a clear dependence on the average load. The larger the load, the lower the energy intensity. This uh, figure comes from an interesting study by Gutschwa and Schaefer that was published in 2013. And so you clearly see that for comparable load sizes, planes are about 10 times more energy intense than trucks. And the rail, again, gains almost a magnitude over uh, uh, trucks. And ships, for very big ones with really big loads, uh, as we saw with the Emma Maersk, they can beat the rail again by one magnitude in uh, energy intensity. So it's clear that long distances uh, should be done with really big ships. Only things that need a high speed uh, should go on planes 
because uh, the energy intensity is very high. If we summarize what we learned so far, we know now that transportation is mainly related to kinetic energy. All the energy is used up to accelerate the vehicle and to swirl the air around them. Uh, the payload is generally fairly small, especially when it comes to personal transport. Uh, you see that if you compare the energy it costs uh, to ride a bicycle in comparison to all the other methods. The bicycle is light in comparison to the person that's riding it. So there we actually see the kinetic energy that is needed to transport the person. We learned that there is a 100 uh, factor between cars and bicycles. And that tells us that uh, most of the energy for conventional transportation methods goes into transporting the vehicle and not the payload. We also learned that uh, energy depends on speed, so if we go slower we can save a lot of energy. This comes from the square uh, relationship uh, between velocity and kinetic energy. So as bottom line, if we want to transport things and persons more energy efficiently, then we need to consider slowing down, going at more constant speed, uh, sharing vehicles to increase the payload. Another way to reduce the energy needed for transportation is of course to use better engines and uh, a better technology. Uh, once we have electricity, that's of course superior to all the other methods because we can convert it with very high efficiency into work. 80% is uh, possible if you compare that with combustion engines where we have about 25%. That is a no-brainer. But the problem right now of course is to generate the electricity. As long as that is not done by uh, wind turbines and solar panels and so forth, uh, we still use a lot of fossil fuel for that. The efficiency is a little bit better in large-scale electricity generation one can maybe achieve up to 50%, but after losses in batteries and so forth, it's actually not so much better than uh, just using combustion engines. One low-tech alternative is bicycles. The technology is fully there and bicycles have a very low energy consumption in comparison to pretty much all other transportation methods. This concludes part two of the transportation segment. Thanks for watching.